Great, so I'm going to start. So welcome everybody to the fourth and final um, of this webinar series. Just before I get started, I just want to say, and I'll remind everybody again at the end, that um, Hospice UK will be sending out an evaluation next week. So we will be really grateful if you could complete the evaluation, tell us what's gone well with this series, what you'd like to see different, done differently, and if there are any more topics that you would like to have covered. Okay. So today we're going to be focusing on the treatment um, of poor appetite and weight loss. So this hopefully will be quite a practical session. Um, so first of all, we're going to look at treatment and thinking about food. Um, we're going to do a little bit of thinking about the use of oral nutritional supplements. I'm going to talk briefly about um, enteral tube feeding and thinking about how we support our families and carers. Okay, so I thought it would be useful just to recap, just to put this into context really. Um, so we have already talked about the impact of malnutrition. So we've talked about what happens to people when they are malnourished and why it's important to try and avoid malnutrition um, wherever we can. However, we have to also think about that in the context of cachexia, which you'll remember we talked about either last session or the session before. Um, we know that cachexia is difficult to, tr to treat and it isn't reversible um, in refractory cachexia. So that's a kind of end stage um, of people's illness. And for those of us particularly working in hospital, uh, hospices, we will be seeing people who have refractory cachexia. Um, but we also know, and I'm sure you experience it very frequently, that being unable to eat causes patients and their families and carers and staff great distress. So although we know that we can't necessarily reverse cachexia, thinking about food and eating and drinking and remembering all the things that I talked about the last time around the psychosocial elements of eating and drinking, I think it is important for us to consider how to provide practical support to patients and their families. And I think this is relevant to professionals in any setting, for those of you in hospices, in nursing homes, in hospitals, um, and it's also really relevant to patients and families in their own homes. So although you might not necessarily be seeing uh, patients on an inpatient unit, or you might not be catering for patients on an inpatient unit, um, you may be seeing people in their own home and have those opportunities and take those opportunities to talk to people about how they're managing with their eating and drinking. Because if you remember the last time, the thing that came out very strongly um, when I did my research and in the evidence in general, is that people worry about not being able to eat and drink the same foods that they used to. So having the opportunity to consider their weight, consider what they are able to eat and drink is really important. And I think for us as healthcare professionals, we need to be very proactive about that. We need to be raising this with people because we know how important it is. So we've talked about nutritional screening. So I think that's the place that we would start from. Um, you will use the outcome of your nutritional screening tool, whatever that might be in your particular setting, to get a, an understanding of any difficulties that that patient may have already had, may have had with maintaining their weight. It may pick up whether there are symptoms of nausea, vomiting, constipation that might affect what people are eating and drinking. Um, when you're doing assessment and screening, you will gain an understanding of how that patient is eating and drinking now, and maybe how they were doing a month or two or three months ago. So to get some kind of um, sense of where that person's come from. Have they had a long period of time where they've not been eating and drinking very well, or is this a very recent thing? You may use food record charts to help you in that assessment. 
And observation at mealtime, there's nothing like observing um, how somebody is managing with their eating and drinking and paying close attention to that. So some places you might use a red tray system. I know lots of hospitals in particular will do this. You'll use a red tray for people who you know have got difficulties with eating and drinking so that those patients get special attention, as it were, at mealtimes. I would actually like to think that from an inpatient perspective, all of our patients get special attention at mealtimes, that we are paying really good attention to how people are actually managing. And also, your nutrition screening may also help you to consider and identify any particular food preferences that somebody might have. Some of those may be religious or cultural preferences. Some may be because of taste changes or texture changes that somebody may um, have had to um, put into place. When I think about treating poor appetite, the first thing I think about is food. So for, in some cases, you may be thinking, oh, should that person be on supplements? Should we be doing an alternative method? Sorry, that's fine. Um, but for me, the first and foremost thing that we need to think about is the food that people eat, because that's what's normal for people. Eating and drinking is what we do day in, day out, and that's what people are familiar with. So we're very much thinking about what people are eating and drinking. So I wanted to pick out a few areas um, that I think we can do something about. So the first thing that often comes up is considering portion size. Okay. So I've put some pictures up there. Um, so you'll see that very hearty roast beef dinner with the great big um, Yorkshire pudding underneath it. Um, and for lots of people, for them, they've had many years of being able to eat and drink whatever they like. They can, they've always managed big portions. Being able to eat a, what they see as a good sized meal is indicative of being strong, being healthy, being able to do the things that they want to do. But what I certainly find is that people's appetites are often impacted on um, whether they have cancer, whether they have other long-term illnesses. That may be because of cancer cachexia or cachexia in general. It may be because they've had periods of not having a poor appetite. And actually, if you look at a meal like this one, I don't know if you can see the pointer, but for lots of patients, they would take one look at that meal and not be able to eat any of it because it just looks totally overwhelming. And people will often say to me, I don't know. Just, 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 I'm just trying to use the pointer. No, that's beyond my capability. Um, lots of patients say to me, my family keep giving me great big meals. I used to have a big plate of food and they're still giving me big meals because they want to feed me up. So we have to work quite hard to help understand what kind of portion size people can manage. And actually, so the top left is a very, very small meal. It's not the most appetizing looking meal, I think, because the, the chicken and the potato kind of all merge into that white background. But you'll see how much smaller that portion is. Now, I will still have patients that say to me that that portion looks too big to them. Because when you have a poor appetite, food, just the sight of food itself, can be quite overwhelming, can be a little bit off-putting. So I think it's really important to work individually with people to find out what, when they say, oh, I really need a small portion, it's finding out what that small portion actually is, because our idea of the small portion might be different to what that person feels that they can manage. And that's why I put up the, portion, the picture there of those little tiny sandwich bites, if you like. I think sometimes, and those of you that are working directly with patients or may have a catering um, background, I think you'll, you'll often see this. If you can put little tiny morsels um, out for people, 
they might be much they might be more inclined to eat it because it doesn't look too much. It doesn't look overwhelming. So those little bite-sized sandwiches, I might just put a couple of those out for somebody and see how they get on. Because what I always feel is that you can come back and have a little bit more, either at the time or later. That great big meal with all the meat and the potatoes and everything else on, you may find that people would have one spoon and one forkful of that and they feel that that's it, they can't have any more. Whereas if you put a much smaller portion out, they actually might finish um, actually a little bit more food. So I think we have to be really considerate when it comes to portion size and really work very, very closely on, with the individual to find out what a small portion actually means to them. We also need to maximise the nutritional content of the food that people are having. And again, we have touched on this previously. We, we will often, dietitians will often call this food fortification. Um, but basically, it's avoiding low fat, low sugar, all the healthy eating um, that, that, that we would talk about and is very important, but not at this stage of illness. So wherever possible, adding extra fats and oils and butter or margarine, um, using full fat milk rather than the reduced fat versions, and adding extra sugar, jam, honey into foods. So this again is about adapting the food that people are eating on a normal basis. It's not about having anything special. It's not about having different meals, it's about having what they feel they can manage, um, but adapted to make it as nourishing as possible. So the picture there with a big swirl of cream in it, that's a great way of enriching um, soups and other um, dishes. Porridge in the morning, I always think is such a great one because lots of people I see will normally have made porridge with water. That, that's just how they've always taken it. And actually, you can really increase the nutritional value if you add full fat milk into it, add a swirl of cream into it and add a spoon of honey into it. But of course, when you are fortifying the foods, what's really important is to make sure it's still palatable for that person, because there's no point loading it with lots of extra fat, for example, that then makes it unappetizing for that person to eat. So I'm sure of those, there are those of you that are cooking in hospices or in nursing homes or in hospitals even. And even when you think about cooking at home, um, you know, it's getting the balance right. So that adding in the extra calories, I think mashed potato is another one. You can add in quite a lot of full fat milk, um, a good blob of butter and maybe even put some cheese on top. So that very small portion of food, and that might be all that somebody has you're maximizing the nutritional value of that food so that that small amount that that person is eating, um, they're getting as many calories, as much, uh, as much energy um, as, as they can from that. I hope all that kind of sits quite comfortably with you. I think it, you know, it makes sense um, and, and feels quite straightforward um, to me. I think um, another important thing, and again, you, you will, if you work with dietitians, you'll probably see this quite often, but I think it comes instinctively, is to think about having a small and often meal plan. I think this works particularly well for people in their own home. Um, I think sometimes in, in any institution where you're working around a shift pattern in a kitchen, for example, Sometimes the meal service has to be a little bit more compacted than you might want it. So I certainly know at St. Joseph's, where I work, I think the food, the meals come a little bit close together. I think breakfast, I mean, our patients often don't wake up or we don't wake them up early. We, it's not like in hospital where you're getting people up at six o'clock in the morning to get all their odds done and get everything ready for the day. Our patients will often... Um, if they've not slept well, they will often be sleeping into the into the morning and they might have a cooked breakfast at about nine o'clock if they're up to uh, a cooked breakfast. 
Lunch then comes about half past 12, and then the evening meal is actually quite early at about half past five, um, which actually feels to me a little bit too close together because we're not, we, we do have snacks in between, and I'll talk a bit about those um, in a moment. But sometimes people say to me, oh, I feel as if the meals are very close. I wouldn't normally eat my breakfast so late, and then I wouldn't normally have my um, meal in the evening so early. So if you've got any flexibility about when you're able to offer your meals, I think that that's fantastic. I know some hospices have a kind of call off order and people can just request food as and when they want it. Um, like being in a hotel and ordering um, through the, um, to, through the uh, room service menu. And I think that that is an ideal situation. Um, but I do also know that we have to be practical and have to think about practical ways of eating and drinking. So where we're thinking about a small and often meal plan, um, I think what's important is, again, to small portions of high energy foods and thinking about eating six or seven times a day. Now, when I say this to patients, they say to me, there's no way I can eat six or seven times a day. Um, and what I try to help people understand is I'm not expecting great big meals six or seven times a day, but small amounts of food spread out throughout the day. So you'll see on the kind of sample um, on the right hand side as you look at it. So in the morning, this is someone who's not having a big cooked breakfast. They're just having a bowl of cereal with full fat milk, just one wheat of it. That's all that that person can manage. What I try and encourage people to do is make the most of the times in between the meals. So rather than just kind of drifting through to lunch without having anything to eat, because if you've got a poor appetite, it can be actually very difficult to motivate yourself to eat. But I try to, be, try to help people use those times in between the meals. So here we've got a milky coffee and a plain biscuit. Um, at the hospice, we offer milkshakes and smoothies in between meals. And sometimes drinks like that can be really, really useful. They don't look so overwhelming for, for, for people to take. Um, smoothies, people often like them, especially if they're not too milky. And although I'd like to put lots of energy and calories and everything, sometimes that nice, refreshing flavor, that citrus flavor or that kind of vegetable refreshing flavour can be very, very appetising for people and stimulate their appetite a bit. Um, so something in the middle of the morning. Now here we've got a really tiny lunch, a couple of crackers with a bit of cheese and butter. And people will say to me, oh, it's, I hardly eat anything. It's not worth having anything at lunchtime because I really don't feel like it, you know, like, like it's worth it. And, and I always try and encourage people to have something to eat, even if it is only a couple of crackers and cheese. Um, because there's also that thing about keep stimulating the stomach. Sometimes if you haven't eaten for a long period of time and then you eat some, you know, you eat some food, you can feel full very, very quickly. Some kind of shrinks down and then all of a sudden it's in action again. So I think having a little bit of food, keep going in, just helps keep the stomach going and um, just feels like a good way for people to just keep getting that energy going inside their body. Here, what we've done is rather than have the yogurt at lunchtime, because people will say, oh, I normally have a sandwich and some fruit and a packet of crisps and a yogurt, but I can't eat all of that there, so I'm not really having anything. I try and get people to spread out that food. So keep the dessert or keep half of the lunch. If they're having a sandwich, have one half at lunchtime, have the other half an hour or two later. We're very much creatures of habit and people get in the habit of their three meals a day and you need to eat this kind of meal at this time and that kind of meal at another time. But I think there's something about trying to be a little bit more flexible. The main meal, which in this case is in the evening, um, a very small meal, a bit like the one that I showed on the picture earlier, just a, a very, very small roast dinner. Um, what I also find for some people is that actually they fatigue as the day progresses. And actually, for a lot of people, having their main meal at the end of the day is not necessarily the best plan for them. Because by the end of the day, they might be very fatigued um, and actually 
not eat up to eating very much at all. So I often encourage people to switch around their meals and maybe have their main meal or a lar the larger of the two meals, if that's how they're going to do it, during the middle of the day and then just have snacks for the rest of the day. So I remember working with one man who had um, end stage COPD and he would get very, very breathless and he would become more and more fatigued as the day progressed. But he would worked as a chef and he was used to being at home, cooking all of his meals from scratch. And that was really, really important for him. And he was very distressed by the fact that he couldn't cook his meal in the evening because he felt too tired. So what we actually worked on was him cooking that meal at lunchtime. So he'd get up in the morning, he'd have a little breakfast, and then he'd spend quite a bit of time during the morning gradually preparing his main meal. And I also helped him to think about sitting down to peel the vegetables, not standing up at the sink all the time or standing up at the work surface. Some people might have a perching stool. So to you know, use those things to help save a little bit of energy. He found that by having his main meal in the, uh, at lunchtime, he was able to eat a little bit more. And then he would just have something very, very light, like the crackers and cheese um, at, at tea time in the evening. And that actually suited him a lot better. And he managed to maintain his weight a lot better using that plan um, rather than focusing everything on six or seven o'clock at night when he was too exhausted. So thinking about how you adjust the meal plan during the day, I think is really important. And then here we've just got a cup of tea and a couple of squares of chocolate at supper time or during the evening. Now, again, sometimes people might be more inclined to have, I don't know, a sandwich or cheese on toast or um, something a little bit more substantial for their supper, if, that, if that's always been their plan. But again, rather than not eating anything, I think what's really important is to eat something. So a little bit of something just to keep you going. So when I'm saying eat six or seven times a day, this is the kind of plan I'm thinking of. For some people, they might only be eating twice a, twice a day now, and all I'm trying to do is get them to have maybe a third snack or meal um, during the day or into the evening. And there's also it's also important to think about changes that you might need to make. So patients who've had chemotherapy or radiotherapy will often say to me, I can't tolerate sweet foods anymore, or I can't tolerate salty foods or spicy foods. Um, people with dementia, we often observe that their taste buds seem to have changed. So families will often say to me, he never used to eat sweet food now, but that's all he wants to eat. Um, so I think it's really important to understand that your taste buds can change, that your taste, how you taste does change. Um, and can change after treatment or because of your disease or illness. And if you prefer to eat sweet foods, then, you know, I'd rather somebody get a bowl of custard or cake and custard than didn't have anything at all. Um, I think for those of us that are catering in hospices or hospitals or wherever, we have to think very carefully about how foods are seasoned, because if things are quite highly seasoned, and go up to the inpatient unit, you will invariably find there's a bunch of people who find it's not got enough seasoning and a bunch of people who say it's far too spicy, salty, sweet, whatever it might be. So having access to condiments there and then so that people can adjust the flavour to suit themselves, I think is really, really important. Again, it's kind of giving it back to the patient. It's helping them make the choices um, of what works best for them. You might also want to think about the texture of foods, um, particularly for people with chewing difficulties or perhaps if you've got, um, if you're very breathless. Foods that take a lot of chewing take a lot of effort and chewing and breathing and swallowing all happen in the same area um, and can be very, very difficult for people to manage. Um, and then if they add in talking on top of that, um, then that can make it even more complicated. So often for people who are breathless, I will be thinking about would soft foods be easier for that person to take? Um, just because 
there's less effort involved in the actual um, chewing and, and swallowing. Clearly, if somebody has an actual swallowing, diagnosed swallowing difficulty, um, you will hopefully have had some advice from a speech and language therapist as to what texture might be most appropriate for that person. Um, I know not everybody's going to have access to speech and language therapy. Um, sometimes you, you might just have to use your judgment and, and observation as to what that person seems to tolerate best. I often advise people that cold foods might be easier to take if you're nauseous. So often the smell of food can be overwhelming for people and actually put them off eating altogether. So we might be thinking, well, let's not have hot food. Let's have cold food. Let's have cereal and cold milk. Let's have sandwiches. Let's have food that you know doesn't smell too strongly because that can be quite overwhelming for some people. And again, flavours like citrus and mint and ginger can be helpful for people who are nauseous or who feel just that kind of general level of nausea and upset stomach. Um, so it's trying out different flavours and, and working um, with people individually. And then the other thing I think is really important is to consider the eating and drinking environment. Um, so for people at home, well, not necessarily at home, um, where I'm uh, at St. Joseph's, we overlook a main road and actually we've got three or four cafes and takeaways across the road and you can often smell the food smells wafting over. Now for some people they really like that, that actually stimulates their appetite, but for other people that those cooking smells can be a bit overwhelming. So for people at home, ideally if they can be away from where the cooking is taking place, away from the kitchen, or if the windows are open and there's a good bit of fresh air circulating just to help keep um, those cooking smells at bay. Um, it often means that people can't do the cooking themselves. If their appetite is poor, sometimes just doing the cooking, by the time they finish that, they almost feel full up even though they've not eaten anything. Um, so I'll often work with families to think about, well, who could do the cooking or what's an easier way of doing this? Um, fresh air can often be helpful. Fresh air and a little bit of gentle exercise, if possible, can sometimes stimulate the appetite. And sometimes I would just say to people, you know, even if that just means going standing by the window or sitting by the window or trying to have a change of scenery, if possible. Um, I think especially if you're an inpatient unit or you're in a hospital, you're in the same bed all the time, you've got the same environment around you, I think sometimes just changing that environment can be really, really helpful. If a patient is able to sit out or sit at a table, again, that's often much more normal and natural for people. It might be more normal for people to sit and eat the, their meal with their food on their lap and, and watching the telly. And if that feels right for them, then I think that that's what we should do. But I think paying attention to the environment to help stimulate um, the appetite, I think, is important. Sometimes I think it's good to avoid distraction at meal times, and that's often the case, for example, for, with people with dementia, because that can cause a lot of confusion and just can be overwhelming for people. For others, actually socialising at a meal time is really important, and sitting with family or friends and eating a small meal and maybe if they're eating as well at the same time, that can often be a way that people can manage to eat. The downside of that is that people often feel watched and judged as to how much they are eating because family are often quite um, concerned about how much people are eating. So it's that balance between that gentle encouragement to eat and that nagging and forcing that, that, that people can find quite difficult. So there's something about balancing that there. I put a note there just to remind me to talk about fluid intake. So obviously, it's really important that people are drinking as well as e eating. Some, there's something about timing the eating and drinking. Because if you, if you are having a big mug of tea 20 minutes before you eat and you've already got a poor appetite, you may find that person's already full up and can't eat because just because they feel full. So I try to encourage people to drink a little bit with their meal or just after their meal so that their stomach isn't overly full um, when they're actually starting to eat. 
and alcohol. So there's a lovely, very retro looking um, drinks trolley there. Um, for some people, having a small glass of wine or a gin and tonic or a little beer with their meal can stimulate their appetite. It can help them feel a bit more normal if that's what they would normally do at home. It's something that they might be able to share with the people around them. Um, and I think can provide a really, really, for, for some people provides a really positive um, outlook to that meal. So I've worked in a few places where we have a drinks trolley. It serves both um, alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks. Patients and their families often think it's a really, really nice thing to do. It makes them feel a little bit more looked after. It makes them feel um, as if it's not just all clinical. It's about living as well as everything else that's going on. I'm not trying to turn everybody into alcoholics, and I'm not saying that we have to have a drink at all, but I think for some people that can be quite a nice part of a meal. Um, and certainly if it was me and I was offered a little gin and tonic before I had my meal, I think that that would you know, perk me up and perk my appetite up a little bit. Um, so I'm sure many of you are, are already doing that and I would encourage it. It works well in hospices. Um, I've worked in a few places that do that. Um, and actually um, at St. Joe's, um, it's the volunteers who do the drinks trolley and they really love doing that drinks trolley. We had a little, we had a short time where the cost of actually running the drinks trolley was um, becoming a little bit of an issue or just became noticed. And actually, the volunteers were the first on the front line saying, we need to keep this. This is really important for patients and their families. And actually, they did fundraising so that we could buy in, um, you know, a nice range of, uh, of drinks for people to have. And often, especially at this time of the year, we'll often get donations made to the ward um, for, for, for the drinks trolley. So that was, I think food is the most important thing. And I just wanted to kind of set out some things for you to think about um, as to how we can support patients at home and in whatever setting we're in to eat and drink, to maximize their nutrition, but within the constraints of having a very poor appetite for a multitude of reasons. I want to talk about nutritional supplements because I think that they really do have a place. Now, often, and I'm sure if I could hear you all, I would be hearing groaning um, at this point. Or sometimes people say to me, oh, they smell horrible, they taste horrible. Sometimes health professionals say that to me and they've never actually tried them before. So if you have a supplement with you, and I have two here, one for me and one for Marie, who's sitting over there, so that we're going to just have a, a tasting now. You don't need to taste the whole thing. I can't taste it all, drink it all, because I'm going to be talking to you. I wanted to show you what I've got here, though. Um, I don't know how well you can see them. One, This bottle is a 200 ml bottle, and this one is a 125 ml bottle. We're even going to take it to the camera. There you go. And then the one behind it is 125 mils. Okay. They don't come out very well in the picture, so that's why I just wanted to kind of show you. I'm finding more and more that these lower volume 125 ml supplements are, are tolerated quite well by patients. So look at the 200 ml bottle and feel a bit overwhelmed by it. But this is a little baby bottle, it looks quite small. And I find that people tolerate that. Now obviously this has got 300 calories in it and this has got 400 calories in it. But 400 calories is no good if it stays inside the bottle and doesn't mm -hmm. go inside the person. So I think if you drank half of one of those and you're getting 150 calories, it's better than having one sip of that and not having any more because it looks a bit overwhelming. Back to the portion side. But I'm going to give Marie the two pals to try and I'm going to open this 40 sip compact. If anybody's got um, the supplement, then have a little taste of it now. And I'll just talk through. So they are a useful source. The only person that we can see is, is it Lorraine. Lorraine. And Lorraine, you don't have a supplement, do you? Don't worry. Maybe afterwards, 
you can have a little try of one. And for those of you that haven't or didn't deliberately bring a supplement with you, I would encourage you just to just to give it a try. I'm just going to have a little sip. Mm. Okay, that's 40 sip compact, apricot flavour. <laughs> it's quite sweet, I have to say. I think I would find that quite sweet to taste. This is at room temperature. It's been in my bag. I will often say to people, try them very cold. Keep them in the fridge or even in the freezer. Put some ice in them. Try them hot, heat it up. How's Marie getting on with the regimen? She's grimacing. I have to be honest, she's grimacing. So they're quite thick um, and they're quite chemically tasting. Yeah. Try different flavours. Some people, I saw a man this morning, he will only take chocolate supplements. It doesn't matter what supplement it is. As long as it's chocolate flavour, he'll take it. Um, and also think about the style of the supplements. I'm just going to go on. So this is our tasting session. Oh, they, somebody has lost our video and webcam, webcam feed. I'll leave Marie to tackle that. I hope everybody else can still hear me. Okay. Oh, and Becky has also lost. Okay. I'm going to carry on. I'm going to persevere. I'm sorry, not everybody is. Is that? Has everybody got me back now? Okay, I'm going to carry on. Um, so, okay, we're back. Okay, great, great, we're back now. So, um, so when thinking about supplements, what I often find is that Patients have been on these supplements during their illness, especially if they've had poor appetite for quite a long time or they've had chemotherapy or they've got COPD and they've been experiencing poor appetite for quite a long time. People will often come to me and I say, have you tried any of those little supplement drinks, you know, the ones that come in the bottle? And they'll say, oh, I can't go anywhere near them. I've had, I've, I'm done with them. I've had everyone under the sun. Um, and that's fine. I, I will never force anybody to have them. I'll look for alternatives. Um, so that might be by having um, a milkshake instead. Or I might try a different style. So if people have only ever had the milkshake style, I might try them on a juice style. I might try a pudding. So there's a variety of supplements um, available. And I think it is worth trying different ones. The other thing, the other... People will often like the ones that are made up with fresh milk, so you can buy things like Complan um, over the counter, or there are some prescribable products that are made up with fresh milk. People can sometimes find those easier to take because the texture is just a bit kind of lighter. You know, for those of you that might have just tasted these, they are a bit kind of, they do coat the tongue a little bit. Um, but I think trying um, ones made up with fresh milk, I think can be really useful. Trying the juice style ones with a bit of lemonade or sparkling water in can make them a little bit more palatable. The bubbles, I think, you know, can, can, can often help. Um, so there's something about being a little bit um, adventurous um, with the supplements and try to avoid just serving them at room temperature in the bottle with a straw because it's probably the least appetizing way of actually having them. The other thing that I really encourage patients to do with them again is spread them out throughout the day because they are very filling. And as it says up there, people can experience early satiety from them. They can feel very full very quickly. And people say, oh, I drink it down in one. And I say, and, and how does that work? Oh, well, then I feel I can't eat anything for the next three hours because I feel so full. So even one of those 125 ml bottles, I would say to people, even if it takes you all day to drink it, just sip on it every now and again throughout the day. Avoid meal times. Don't have it just before a meal. Um, start one just after a meal. Sip it slowly and then give yourself a break. So that's everything I was going to say about the kind of oral side. Oh, I hope you're all still there. I just want to, we've only got about, oh, less than five minutes. I'm sorry. I, is it is it quarter two that we finished? We've got a few more minutes. Oh, okay, fine. Um, so just to talk a little bit about enteral feeding, tube feeding. 
we might have talked a bit about this um, on previous sessions. And I, and I think probably what I've already said is my perception is that we see tube feeding much more frequently now in hospices, certainly, than, than we did 10 years ago. And I think that is because people are starting tube feeding much earlier in, in their illness. So for people with head and neck cancer, they often have a tube placed very, very early on in their illness because we know that if they're having treatment um, around their head and neck, it is going to affect their ability to eat. Um, and it's much, I'd, I'd say that we're much more proactive now at placing tubes earlier on, and they are generally going to be gastrostomy feeds. Um, gastrostomy tubes of various kinds and this isn't this isn't a whole session about gastrostomy feeding so I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail but the lower picture the second picture of the, uh, on the slide um, that's a, that's showing somebody bolus feeding so that's when a liquid like this um, type of thing is poured into the um, syringe which is attached to the tube and then it goes in by gravity. Um, above is a picture of a pump because some people will have their feeds pumped in over a period of time. So that might be 10, 12, 16 hours, depending on the individual. And again, I've been interested to see that over the past few years, I see more and more people who are bolus feeding rather than pump feeding. So when I first I won't talk about when I first became a dietitian. I'd say about 20 years ago, everybody would be pump feeding. We hardly ever did bolus feeding. Um, but actually, I think we're coming around to the, the idea that actually bolus feeding is easier for a lot of people. Um, it mimics normal life a little bit more it, because you can give your bonuses of feed at your meal times and at your snack times. So for a lot of people, it feels like a much more normal way, even though it is a very artificial way of feeding. But you can have a bolus at breakfast, lunch and dinner, and then you may need them in between times as well. For some people, they prefer the ease of setting up a, a pump, letting it pump in over a period of time, disconnecting and then forgetting about it. And for other people, they like to do that particularly at night time. So the feeding is all happening overnight while they're asleep. And then during the day, they're not attached to anything. They don't have to think about it. So different feeding methods work for different people. And I think it's really important for us to work with people to find out what suits them and their routine and their family life um, or their working life as they may still be working. Um, to find out what suits them best. For, it, for some people, it may be their sole source of nutrition. So it may be all that they're having is through that tube. For quite a lot of people, it might be in combination with small amounts, amounts of oral food. And certainly I see people who, um, especially towards the end of their life, who they may still be using the pump feed or the tube feed, but even though swallowing is really, really difficult, they might still be taking a little bit of food as well for the pleasure of having the food because that is, you know, feels very important to them. The feeding plan should be devised by a dietitian and that should be done in collaboration with the patient in care and carers, taking into account the things that I've just said, the timing, the method and other sources of nutrition. You may find that often people will come to you already on a feeding plan. And if that feeding plan is working for them, then I wouldn't interfere with it. I see lots of people that the feeding, the end of the, the tube feeding is absolutely fine. They're tolerating it as they are. They don't need to make any changes. They've been managing it for six months on their own at home. And they don't need me as a dietitian coming in and making changes for the sake of it. And I think people also need to be empowered. If they're used to giving their own feeds, then we need to enable them to do that in in the inpatient unit as well. Sometimes people do need changes made and that's where it is helpful to have a dietitian available who is able to work with that patient, work with that family to work out what the best changes are for that person. And as somebody is coming towards the end of their life, we may find that we will gradually start reducing the amount of feed 
according to how much that person can tolerate. So as somebody is dying, they, they, be, they start to eat less. They don't feel hungry, um, they, they don't want to eat. And I use that same rationale when we're thinking about people on tube feeding, that if people have got abdominal distension, if they've got pain and discomfort, if they've got um, diarrhea, then that might indicate they're not tolerating that feed very well. So we will decrease the rate to a level that they feel comfortable with. And just like when people are dying, we will continue to offer them food and drink right up until the end of their life. It is the same with enteral tube feeding. We have to do this very, very carefully. And I think it's, um, it's a discussion of its own, really. There's a lot of ethical discussions around enteral tube feeding, but on a practical basis, I think if the communication is good, if we're looking at the patient, looking at how they are actually tolerating, um, as people start to um, deteriorate and they are not tolerating um, their eating, their nutritional intake, then we will gradually work with them and decrease it to a level that they're able to tolerate. And I will see people who are still having the odd bolus of feed right up until they die because they think, oh, I do feel a little bit hungry today and I can manage and I do want to manage that. So I think that's appropriate and I think that really good communication across the uh, multidisciplinary team but with the patient and their family at the heart of that is absolutely essential. And just to finish, I just wanted to point you in the direction of some well, hopefully useful resources. These are the kind of resources that I use and that are available um, quite freely. Um, so the British Dietetic Association um, has a food facts area on its website that anybody can access. Um, there is one leaflet there particularly on malnutrition and that will reinforce some of the things that um, I've talked about during this presentation. It's also really useful for information about other conditions. Um, so there's, just for your general interest, there's information about healthy eating, diabetes, um, weight reducing diets, there's, um, ident there's um, leaflets on specific nutrients. So there might be one, that, there's ones on, um, iron, for example. So that's just the, the kind of page that you'll land on if you put in, if, if you look on the BDA website and go into food facts, um, and then there's a big drop down menu that takes you through to those resources that are usually a two sided, quite straightforward guide. It doesn't replace seeing a dietitian if you've got a specific condition, but it will give you some useful information. Macmillan have some great information and I use that quite a lot with patients. So I have put um, some examples up there. The eating problems and cancer, I think, is a particularly good one, um, as is the building up diet. And again, Macmillan um, information is usually really easy to get hold of. Um, there's lots of Macmillan information points around in hosp hospitals, for example, and um, they're, they're all free for you to order um, from their website. I put this one um, up. So this is um, called the Malnutrition Pathway uh, Organization. Um, and they have some really, really useful information that is endorsed by the British Dietetic Association, the Royal College of Nursing, and the Royal College of Speech of Speech and Language Therapy, um, amongst others. There's a whole range. Um, so that's a really good place to go to to look for information. So the one I, I just took a screenshot there, um, Guide to Making the Most of Your Food, that is a really simple leaflet that um, I often use for patients in our group setting, for example. So where I'm not doing an individual assessment on somebody, I can give them generalised information that, that, that is often quite useful. And you'll be able to access the slides afterwards, so you'll be able to uh, follow the links for those um, websites. And then the final one that I just came across quite recently, the Malnutrition Task Force and Age UK have la launched this booklet. It's a really, really engaging booklet um, called Let's Talk About Death and Dying. But it does have a page on it about eating and drinking. And I think that it, 
it's often a difficult thing to talk about, particularly when people are deteriorating and dying. Um, so that is a very user-friendly um, booklet for patients and their families. And I've just put the um, eating and drinking page, but, but it talks all about, about all elements of um, death and dying. So just to summarize, we know that eating and drinking has really important um, nutritional and psychosocial signif significance for patients and their families. As I've said quite frequently, as healthcare professionals in whatever setting and in whatever um, discipline we are, we need to acknowledge the impact of weight loss for people. We need to acknowledge what change means for people. We need to be able to talk about the impact of cachexia because being able to say to somebody, you know, this is because of your disease. This isn't because you're not trying hard enough. Um, I, I think can be quite reassuring for people. Um, we need to be able to give people practical advice to support them with their poor appetite. And I think it's also important to know that when to seek specialist support and in your local area, how to access that specialist support, because it will be different um, depending on where you are. So I'm going to wrap up at that point. Um, I do hope that you found the series useful.